So today, we continue studying the uh, consequences of Cauchy integral formula and Cauchy representation formula we had. Uh, but before continuing, but before say, saying a few words, uh, let me just mention uh, the, what is known as Morera theorem. which states the following. <clears throat> Assume that uh, F uh, is a continuous function such that continuous function in D such that For any triangle T, okay, the integral over the triangle of F Z D Z is zero. D, of course, is a domain in C. Hmm? Then there exists the function F. Okay which is holomorphic and such that f prime of z is f of z. In other words, f of z is also holomorphic. Okay? This is nothing special in some sense, but what I wanted to show you is that the idea well, we have an equivalent, more general statement of this Morera theorem already. Huh? We proved that when the, the, this property is valid for any closed curve, then necessarily we do have a primitive, and then the function is. But I wanted to show you the, the, the very elegant idea in the proof of the theorem. So what you don't, uh, probably in this statement, you don't see the, the very striking idea of the proof. So, like in Gursa theorem, there was a geometric interpretation of the condition on the triangle, of the rectangle for Gursa and now on the triangle. So, the idea is the following. So, you define in this omega in domain D, you do take point A and consider the segment connecting A to Z, right? And you define F of Z to be capital F of Z, right? To be the integral over the segment. And I write it this way, right? Just to indicate the segment of F, W, D, W. Okay. Then I take another point, Z naught, and I consider F of Z minus f of z naught. And this is the integral of the difference of the two integrals but since we have a triangle here this is the triangle we are considering. This difference is in fact the integral over the third side, so it is the integral between on the segment is easy not fw dw. All right. This is a sketch of the proof, right? Sketch of the proof. As I said, the general statement has been already uh, showed, but this is just for the proof. It is, it, this is another proof, okay? Another way to prove the, the same result. So now we, we can also consider this difference over z minus z naught. And this becomes 1 over z minus z naught of the integral over the segment of f. 
And then I take this incremental ratio minus f of z0. f of z0 does not depend on w. So it's a constant. So I can put it in on the right-hand side of this. In this expression, I can also put it inside the, the integral because we are integrating over the interval, right? So in some sense, I make this kind of And when I consider the, <coughs> the modulus, sorry, of the left hand side, okay, I can also take this estimate, one over z minus z naught, which is the length, by the way, of the side. Pardon me? Right. So this is this is not there is no parenthesis here, right? There is, there is no parenthesis. I didn't. But when I consider this length, I can also take the integral of the modulus of the difference over dw, because this is a constant, right? And the constant over an integral, oh, over, sorry, over, over, uh, a con the integral of a constant over an interval is the constant times the length, the length of the integral, which is over here. But this number, OK, tends to 0 if z tends to z naught. Correct? Because we are assuming that the function is, in fact, continuous. So this can be made smaller than epsilon. And this is the proof. So I wanted to show you this proof. So it's somehow an elegant proof. And you can repeat it, of course, in the general case. So this, in fact, is smaller or equal to the maximum of this when w is in this compact set, OK? So independently on w. And then you can make it as small as you want, because this is precisely the distance, so the, the distance uh, taken for continuous function or interval, OK? So just, just because of this for, com for the sake of completeness in, in, the, in, the, in the subject. And now, let us continue by, OK, this is number three. Let us continue by considering the consequences of the, of the um, Cauchy integral representation. I want to remind you that <coughs> if we have a function f, holomorphic, And D, correct? And I take A in D and a curve, gamma, closed curve. So the general statement we have is that the value of F in A is 1 over 2 pi I and gamma A, the index, over times the integral over gamma of f c x minus a dx. Correct? So in particular, as I said, if this is d and this is a, we can take as a curve circle around A of centers A, OK, inside D, huh? and the radius R. So that gamma of T is A plus R 
EIT, and T varies between 0 and 2 pi. So that this index is, in fact, 1. All right? Good. Now, so this can be done locally at any point. So this, if you want, is a local version, which is enough for us at the moment. All right. So now consider this is the notation I need. As I said, take the circle of radius R centered at A and consider take the general point Z, right? Uh, all right, 1 over 2 pi i, I folks. And z is any point here. Hmm? So the, the aim of this calculation will be to show that any function which has this integral representation is, in fact, analytic, complex analytic. So that we somehow close our description of holomorphic function as functions which are complex differentiable and, in fact, complex analytic. We started from examples from complex analytic functions and proved that they are, in fact, holomorphic, and now we prove the reverse. Any holomorphic function satisfies the Cauchy integral representation, and then we prove that this implies that it is complex analytic. We do the following. So we take, okay, C varies here, right? So C minus A as a modulus R, constant. But I take Z uh, such that Z minus C is, in fact, a smaller, sorry, Z minus A, right, smaller than R. So inside the disk. The center of the disk is A, and I take Z inside. Remember that C, because we are integrating over gamma, I didn't say it, okay. This is my preferred gamma circle. So each point C varies on the circle, whereas Z can be taken arbitrarily outside inside. But I take it inside so that Z minus A is smaller than R. And then I write this equality, Z minus Z, C minus A plus A minus Z. which is, of course, obviously true, and which can be also written as C minus A times 1 plus A minus Z over uh, C minus A. Or equivalently, C minus A times 1 minus Z minus A, C minus A. Right? What can I say? With our assumption here, we can also say that this number, this ratio here, is smaller than 1, which is important. Because we recognize in this expression what the sum of a series, not of a series, the series of, of, uh, of a power series generated by this ratio. Right? So with this in mind, continue here. And we have that, so what we are integrating is this, which becomes this. Uh, And since Z minus A over 
c minus a is more than 1, strictly can be also written as f of c over c minus a summation and greater or equal to 0 of this, z minus a over c minus a to the power n. Right? So this, in fact, is this. Right? Good. So now, remember that this was the integrand. We have the following. 1 over 2 pi i, over the integral gamma of this is, in fact, now with the new, if you substitute, becomes 1 over 2 pi i, integral over gamma, summation, sorry, maybe, well, I put it this way, f of c, c minus a, then summation n greater or equal to 0 of z minus a to the power n over c minus a to the power n dc. Correct? Just substitu the substitution of this with this. And this is consistent. But now, I notice that z minus a does not depend on c. So I can take out of the integral, and I can also add 1 to this exponent in order to have c minus a and this summation. In other words, I can write <coughs> f of z, so this is number 7, f of z is i write it this way, 2 pi i integral over gamma summation and greater or equal to 0 f of c, c minus a to the power n plus 1. Remember that we have an extra coefficient, extra, sorry, extra um, term, right? And then I can also integrate here and take z minus a the power n out, which is very close to what we are looking for, right? If we prove that this is a, sorry, if we can take out the symbol of summation and we obtain that this is a number, call it not, a, not here, but well, the integral of this, okay? So forget the <laughs> symbol of summation. And this, call it for n, for each n, call it a n, okay, without this, we are done. But remember that with this, we meant a, a limit, the limit of the partial sum, so that here we are taking the limit, of, or we want to prove that the limit of an integral is the integral of a limit. Is it true in general? Well, not in general, unfortunately, <laughs> but in this case, in particular, it works fine. It should. And let me remind you one simple result we should know from, some, from general calculus, which applies to this particular case. So. We are left to this point, and then, and then we continue, okay? We cannot conclude. But we have all, so the, 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 the um, feature of what we are looking for is very close. Huh? This is z minus a, so to the power n, so through select a power c, and this is very close to be a, a coefficient. Good. So, <clears throat> so let me just recall you that when you have, when we are in the case we are dealing with essentially, so gamma uh, rectifiable curve, so that you can calculate the, the, the length of the curve, right? We have 
curve, reasonable curve, right? So. Um, and C, and they'll take F, or we could call it UN, uh, just to be okay. UN a sequence of continuous functions on gamma. Right? In fact, we are considering function restricted to the curve gamma. And gamma is a circle in our in our uh, proof, right? So a circle is rectifiable. Okay? So this is more general statement. And we take then U to be the uniform limit, U limit, a sentence to infinity of UN. This is a uniform limit on gamma. So the uniform limit, okay, so independently from, from the parameter you are considering on the curve, is a continuous function because it's a unit for limit of continuous function. And we can take the integral of a u over gamma of u, and this is, in fact, as the limit of this numbers. OK? You are, are you with me? So remember that what you say, well, what is this relate, what, what is the relationship of what we are doing, what we were doing before? Well, remember here on the right hand side we have the the limit of the integrals, and inside here you have the u limit, so uniform limit, right? So the limit of <coughs> of the value of the single of each integrals converges to the integral of the uniform limit of the functions, which were is our our task, right? So this depends on the fact, well, this, I think that this is, should be obvious to you. You should have already seen this somewhere in some of the courses. However, if you take, say, well, any z, okay? This can be made small than epsilon, right? For any z in gamma along the curve, so for any epsilon positive, there exists a not or n such that for any n greater than n, this is true for any z, right? This is, in fact, the, the hypothesis we are taking. So u is the uniform limit of the uns. Hmm? It is continuous, and you have also In particular, we take the integral of a gamma of u n minus the integral of u, and you take this in. And this is the integral of gamma u n minus u. And this is smaller or equal. Remember, one of the inequalities we proved explicitly, and we used several times. This is small equal to integral gamma of u n minus u, okay? And this can be made smaller than epsilon because, well, this is what? Epsilon prime. This is epsilon times the length of the curve gamma, which is finite, right? So that's why I'm assuming that the curve is rectifiable. So it is as small as we want, so we are done. So going back to this case, special case, then we can say that this is, in fact, summation of 1 over 2 pi i of the integral of gamma f of c, x minus a, and plus 1, dx, and this whole stuff is, will be called a n times z minus a to the power n. All right? 
which is more than what we want because we have an expression of the coefficients in terms of an integral. And if we are smart enough to, to understand the meaning of the coefficients, we can also say, well, this gives you also information on the higher derivatives of the function f itself. Okay, so for the time being, what we have showed here is that indeed, start, starting from a function which admits a Cauchy integral representation, in particular if it is holomorphic, it has this representation, we can always find uh, coefficients, which we explicitly wrote here, of the uh, power expansion in a neighborhood of a point where it is defined, so that this guarantees it is locally analytic, an analytic, complex analytic function, right? So that there is a complete characterization of holomorphic function, those functions which are complex analytic. And as we'll see, the fact that it is local is not restrictive because then we show that if you know something locally for holomorphic function, then it will be somehow globally uh, uh, extended. Good. All right. What, okay, what we uh, uh, have to prove in some sense is, well, to conclude like this, we have to be sure, well, just to, just to be very precise, we have to be sure that this number here can be calculated and that, well, the, the integral can be taken. Well, this is, in fact, the, um, gives you the, the sequence of uh, function, well, not the integral, okay? This is the sequence of functions, so the sum the partial sums up to the order n is the sequence u n and the previous lemma. We have to prove that the limit is uniform, huh? just to be on the safe side. But this is done quite easily because, well, uh, remember that we have f of c over c minus a to the power n plus 1, then I have also z minus a to the power n hmm? to be considered. Huh? And, well, you take the Modulus, this is, in fact, the modulus of f of c, and then I have c minus a to the power n plus 1, and then I have z minus a, yeah. And we are taking the integral of a, a curve, a compact curve, a compact subset. So in particular, this number here can be, is banded, right? That is m times modulus of z minus a to the power n over r n plus 1. Remember that c minus a represents the, the radius of the, the, the circles, the circle, I right? consider, because c varies on the curve gamma. And well, and since we are now and here, this is m over r times z minus a modulus over r power n. And this number here, this number is more, it's less than 1. So this is this guarantee. This is, this is if you want the m-test application to guarantee that this is well. All right. So everything works fine. And we are now uh, at a certain uh, stage that we can conclude something. In particular, we can say the following. Well, remember <coughs> that the coefficients the, in, a, in, the, in, the, in a complex analytic function, but in general for functions which are analytic and C infinity, and then C infinity regularity, well, you can calculate the derivatives, and term by term derivation is what we applied for our case, and it works fine because we have a, pr a proof of this fact. If you differentiate term by term, consider another, another series with the term by term, uh, the, the terms of the, the, the series as a dif difference of the <coughs> previous term. So you obtain the derivative which was proved huh, to be true. Huh? 
it was proved that this is equivalent to consider the derivative in the sense of the complex numbers theory. Hmm? All right. Uh, and the value of the nth derivative at the point A was related, remember, the value with the coefficient, with the nth coefficient up to a constant. Remember this. This is n factorial of a n. Now we will start from, say, f z to be summation a n z minus a to the power n. Correct? So this is a n, n factorial. This is in general true because the other terms have something like z minus n to power n plus something. And so when you calculate it at a, they, 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 they vanish. So this is the first term. But then we, also can, we can also say that this is, in fact, 1 over 2 pi i, the integral of a gamma of f of c, c minus a, plus 1, x. Correct? Because this was defined to be a m and the previous expression, which tells us something interesting. All right. As I said before, well, gamma is the circle, because otherwise I have to put n gamma a, right? Gamma is the circle. And then, as I said before, f of c is smaller than m on gamma. Because it is a closed curve, it's a compact set, f is continuous, so it has a maximum. Its modulus has a maximum, right? And c minus a is r, since gamma is a plus r e i t. And t is in, in the interval is 0 to pi. So we are taking the circle. So that the modulus of f and a is n factorial, smaller or equal n factorial m over rm. Do you see this? Well, you might say, well, but there is something else here. And the, the n plus 1 is not here. But we also have the xc, huh? remember this. In fact, when you calculate, well, let us do it as an exercise. Okay, <clears throat> This is to be checked. This is Cauchy estimate, right? This will be Cauchy estimate when I prove it. <laughs> For the moment, it's just a statement, OK? <laughs> Claim. So what I'm saying is that, well, we have to consider this integral over gamma when gamma is a plus e i t r. Correct? So that this becomes, and as I said, t is in between 0 to pi. So this is 1 over 2 pi i integral from 0 to 2 pi. Hmm? And I have to substitute f of gamma t. Then gamma t is this, right? So a minus a, 0, so f r e i t to the power n plus 1. And then I have here gamma prime of t dt.
and this is 1 over 2 pi i integral from 0 to 2 pi f of gamma, gamma t. And then gamma prime of t is what? E, oh, sorry, r e t, right? R i e i t, because I'm differentiating with, with uh, respect to t. So here I have r e i t, and here I have r n i t. Uh, and plus one. Sorry, R and plus one, right? And then This can be okay if I take the modulus. So here, our i n appears on the on the denominator. It, the integral of r t is controlled by the mod modulus of this, and this is a constant. Okay, and so i disappears, in it. and so we are done. All right. So this is an important estimate, and as as we said, <coughs> this r here represents the radius of the circle we are we have considered from the very beginning centered at A. But assume that you have very general complex analytic function. So it has a power expansion written and it has a radius of convergence R, which is the largest radius where the function is defined. So this kind of game can be repeated for any R inside the disk of convergence of the function itself, independently, in some sense. As we, as we know, if we take R strictly smaller than capital R, where R represent, capital R represents the radius of convergence of the series, or the function, so analytic function, then we are sure that the convergence is actually uniform. Remember, this was proven in Adamar's theorem. So that this estimate can be uh, repeated, as I said, for any R. And so the best estimate is when R approaches capital R, because the number increases, right? The denominator, so it is smaller. So the best estimate, in fact, is with R being the radius of convergence. So this is correct, then applies to any radius inside the, the disk of convergence, and in the general form is as follows. So Cauchy estimates, sorry, I'm sorry, this is 12, right? Cauchy estimates and the first F complex analytic in B a capital R, so f of z is this power expansion, a n, z minus a, the power n, and right? Then we have that uh, f and a is smaller or equal to n factorial m over uh, to the power n, m being the maximum of f of z of right? And okay, these are Cauchy estimates, and it has interesting cons consequences. Uh, in particular, well, we can also say that a n is, remember that this is f n a over n factorial, right? As I said. Hmm? 
Now assume uh, that you know this. F is holomorphic and this now can be finally considered to be equivalent complex analytic. And C. So this equivalently means that R is plus infinity. Correct? So in C means that the register convergence is the largest possible, plus infinity. And we have examples of function with the register convergence infinite. For instance, the exponential. Any polynomial. Correct? Good. And this is something. But assume that F has its modulus which is bounded. Then, what do we have? We have that AN, the coefficients, and the power expansion turn out to be well, this is up to a constant is this is smaller or equal to what? M over yeah, right? And this tends to zero since R is infinite. infinite. So you take a, take another R, right? Smaller center at A and then make it go to infinity. This estimate works fine, okay, for any R. What do we have? That all the coefficients are zero. So except the, the first coefficient, right? When n is zero. So the function itself is constant. This is Liouville the theorem, right? So it 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 can summarize it in the in the following way. Any function which is complex analytic. And its radius of convergence is infinite. And, bound, and its modulus is bounded is, in fact, the constant function. So, this is a, so it means <laughs> that the function exponential, complex exponential, is not bounded. It also means that cosine and sine are not bounded. Complex cosine, sine, all right? <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> we, we, they have to be constant, right? Good. We apply Liouville theory sem ther several times, but w uh, I want to use the terminology which, are, which is, uh, which is uh, standard in many books. So when you say the function f is homomorphic in C, we actually mean equivalent to f is an entire function. All right, so it's just a name, it's a term. Entire function means, okay? So for entire function, there is this very, very important um, geometric uh, characterization. If they are bounded, they are constant. So let us apply this fact for a proof of the fundamental theorem of algebra. So you, I guess that you all know <laughs> the statement of the fundamental theorem of algebra, and you probably have already seen one of the proofs of this theorem, fundamental theorem in algebra. But you probably don't know that uh, it was Gauss who actually proved this theorem with several proofs. And in his uh, master thesis, so he was quite a smart guy. You know? He used, well, he, he, other approaches. But essentially, he used something related to the index of curves. Winding numbers associated to polynomials. So the statement is as follows. So take a polynomial P uh, 
of degree greater or equal to 1 in C. Well, P has a root in C. I guess this is fundamental. of algebra. And that's why now we consider the complex numbers to be, in fact, the algebraic closure of the reals. Because of the reals, the theorem fails to be true. There are examples. We have shown examples of degree 2, not of degree 1, of degree 2, where this theorem fails to be true. Right? But as uh, one of my uh, teachers told me one when it was your age. So if you want to miss the beauty of the convex number, just restrict your attention to the algebraic properties. Well, this is just one of the properties. If you want to see all the beauties of the convex numbers, please look at the analysis and the geometry beyond algebra. Well, algebra is important, of course. So the proof, of one of the proofs, is a consequence of the Liouville theorem. Assume by contradiction, assume that P of Z is not zero for any Z. So by contradiction, okay? Sorry? I'm saying by contradiction, well, okay? And then I consider the holomorphic function one over P of Z it turns out to be holomorphic. holomorphic. Where? For any C. For any, so sorry, for any Z. So in C, right? With this. So it is entire, right? It is entire. So one of the hypotheses of Lewis theorem is satisfied. Can we prove that f of Z has a module which is bounded? Yes, we do. Because f of z has modules which is 1 over p of z, modules of p of z, and p of z, well, it's never 0 first. Well, what is already used? But also, when z tends to infinity, modules of p of z tends to infinity. So we can do it like this. We can restrict our consideration to a disk, and inside this disk, P of Z as any continuous function, they say the closed disk. Inside of this disk, this polynomial has a max, the modulus of this polynomial has a maximum, right? And a minimum <laughs> as well, right? This is Weierstrass theorem, right? But outside this, so in, in the infinite region outside this, we, we know that P of Z has a module which diverges to infinity. Hmm? This is because P of Z is not the constant polynomial. And since the modules, you know, this, can, can, you, can, you, can, you can use the, the, a simple estimate on the modules. And since Z of Z has a module which tends to infinity, P of Z has a module which tends to infinity. But then F of Z is bounded. Sorry, the modulus of f of z is bounded. Right? So it is an entire function which is also bounded, so f is constant. QED. And so we have a contradiction. Contradiction. You will theorem. Now we have also examples of functions which are entire and never vanish. For instance, the exponential. But it's not a polynomial. It's not a polynomial. <laughs> right. Now I might be interested in the possibility of extending holomorphically 
this is some, somehow a higher degree uh, question. I might be interested in extending a polynomial to, inf to the Riemann sphere. Can I do this? It has a value to infinity. Well, okay. I have to repeat. I have to repeat. Okay. So, one is of, the, of your suggestion is correct. We can take the limit. Okay. But remember, the holomorphicity means that something is known about the neighborhood of a point. Not that simply you add the value at a point. So you can continuously extend the function, but not holomorphically, for instance. Well, this has to be checked, right? Do you, you understand what I mean? Well, it's obvious that since we have this, polynomial cannot have a finite value at infinity if you want to extend it at infinity, right? Because otherwise it wouldn't be even continuous. So, well, you can extend it. Then it, there is no hope to find, <laughs> to, to have an, a holomorphic extension. However, however, what we do when we consider the Remember that, um, that we introduced the uh, Riemann sphere, the extended complex plane, by in applying the serographic projection, right? Mm -hmm. Correct? So if you want, you have a hemisphere which represents the disk, and the other hemisphere which represents what is outside the disk. And to reverse the positions, you have to consider 1 over z. What is outside, put inside, and then consider 1 over p of 1 over z, and see how it works. And consider what happens at 0 there, and extend it there. And if you find power expansion, then we are in the good position. And in fact, you can add infinity in some cases, and in some others you cannot. Why? Because remember that our function, if they are extended to the Riemann sphere, since they are continuous, and the Riemann sphere is, con is compact, they must have modulus. exactly modulus which is bounded. So in particular, when we show that locally you have information which comes global, then if it is locally constant, then Unfortunately, it's globally constant, so you, you cannot extend it, right? Or you can extend it, but it is constant. So in fact, very few functions are holomorphic on the entire sphere, Riemann sphere, the constant sphere. There's constant functions, <laughs> which is one of the cases, the constant polynomials. Do you understand why? Well, if you don't, I'm not, I'm not saying that this is an explanation, but if you don't, I will give you some extra okay, results in order to understand this. Good. And in fact, the next step is to start considering and, and describing the properties the so-called local properties of holomorphic functions. So we'll investigate in the next lessons, ne next uh, lessons, um, zeros, singularities, whatever. But first, we have to, I want to, <laughs> I want to give you a very important characterization of holomorphic functions. The so-called identity principle for holomorphic function. This is a proposition. Um, I refer to this result as the identity principle, which, as you'll see, has no counterpart in the real case, in the real, even in the real analytic case. In the real, so C infinity case is no counterpart. Assume that uh, D is a domain. 
and I write it explicitly open and connected. subset of C. Important to be connected out here. Huh? Then F holomorphic and D. So the following statements are equivalent. First, f is identically zero in D. The second is that there exists an A in D such that the nth derivative of f, f is holomorphic, so we know that now it is infinity, blah, blah, blah. But at A is zero for any n. And third characterization as the following, the set of zeros z of f, so the set of points z in d such that f of z is zero, has an accumulation point or limit point. So what I'm saying is that there exists a point A in the domain D such that each derivative of f at A is 0, including the, the 0 derivative, which is the value of the function. Well, of course, 1 implies 2 and implies 3. <laughs> what is difficult to prove is that 3 implies 2 and 2 implies 1, so that the 3 statements are equivalent. Once we have this, we can say, well, if locally two functions agree on a, an open set, well, they agree elsewhere where are defined. And this gives you the possibility to extend holomorphic function if it's in sense of a germ. So you have something in an open set, something else in a, another open set which intersects in something with an interior then the function can be extended. Okay. So is it clear what I meant here in the second condition? So uh, I'm saying that if there exists A, the, the existence of A is important, right? So as noticed, of course, well, this is 1 implies 2 and implies 3, right? Now, we prove that 3 implies 2, and 2 implies 1. OK. So by contradiction, OK, assume that there exists a knot such that f and knot of A is not zero for any A and D. And not So that the power expansion of f of z is like this, right? Summation of n 
right? So take, well, A0. So assume that A0 is the minimal such that this, this uh, occurs. Hmm? And so that we can write this AM C minus A to the power N, which is, in fact, summation of F N at A over N factorial, right? Z minus A to the power N. So take the minimal such a note. Hmm? Now we define another function, g of z, which is related to f in the following way. Let g of z be such that be such that f of z is z minus a and not g of z. Or assume that g of z has summation of a n z minus a to n minus n naught equivalently, right? I show you. We have this or this equivalently, which is Right? Good. Now, what do we have? Well, remember that a n is the nth derivative of a at the nth derivative of f at a over n factorial. Mm -hmm. And we also have, therefore, that uh, g of a. is a and not, which is different from 0. Because we are assuming that f and not, so the and not derivative of f at a is not 0. And this number here is the first and the power as function of g. So this is a, is a term without z minus a, right? When n is n naught, okay, you assume that f n by contradiction, this is different from zero, so this is different from zero. But this is a continuous function, right? It is allomorphic. Well, it is allomorphic. Complex analytics, so it is also holomorphic. And g of a is different from zero, so it is different from zero in a neighborhood of a, right? By continuity. So, well, this is to be remarked here that g is holomorphic in D. Hmm? This is the power expansion. And this uh, uh, implies a continuity g of z is not 0 in a neighborhood of a. Say, in an open ball, say, in B A R with R positive. And everything works fine. But now assume that A can be assumed to be 
the limit point point of the f. Remember that we are assuming that point three in the statement is true. That is to say that the set of uh, zeros has a limit point. So this is a limit point of zeros. Good. So there exists then B and B A R B and Z F, right? Because of the definition of limit point. Okay, A limit point of Z F is in fact equivalent to say that given any neighborhood of this limit point, accumulation point, in D, okay, there exists an element in ZF, you know, the set which, for which A is the limit point, such that A is in this neighborhood. You take as small as you want, but there is an element. Now, B is in ZF, and so this is also true, B minus A is smaller than R. Whatever R is taken, but B in ZF means equivalent to that F of B is zero. Right? So this condition guarantees that B is not A so there is an element which is not A in ZF, close to A as much as I want. This is, hmm? but F of B is zero means also that B minus A to the power N of G of B is zero. And this is not zero. Since we don't have zero divisors, the only possibility is that G of B is zero which contradicts the fact that g of z is not zero whenever z is taken in the neighborhood b a r. So this is a contradiction. Correct? Are you with me? Good. So by contradiction, we prove this. Now, to complete the proof, let me assume that all the derivatives at a point a in d is uh, all the derivative, each derivative at A is zero. Now I want to prove that the function is, is in fact identically zero, which in fact gives you the idea of the name, identity principle. So if, in some sense, if you know this characterizes completely complex analytic functions, if you know the coefficients, of a power expansion in a neighborhood, then you know the function. And there is no other function with the same coefficients. Take the difference. Uh, if the difference is zero, then all the coefficients are the same, which is vice versa. If the all the coefficients are the same, then they are the same function. So coefficients and power series, so the coefficients of power series uh, are the same, okay, locally. Now uh, okay, I want to prove this, so that we are um, assuming point two, I want to prove that F is identical, is it right? So I take A to be the set of point Z in D for which this is zero for any N. Okay, this is a set. Is it empty? No because I'm assuming that two is true. So A is not empty, because A in the statement of the, of the proposition is in A. So there exists A, okay? So if we want equivalently, we say the set is not empty, is statement two. Now, what we'll prove is the following. This set will be 
open and connected. And then it is the entire domain D. So it follows from topological consequence of the assumption of the domain. Right? How do we prove that A is closed? Consider Z and the closure of A. I want to prove that Z is in A, right? So Z is the limit point of Zn points in A. Or if you want, Zn tends to Z. What can I say about this? Well, uh, remember that ZK is in A, so all the derivatives. So for any point, all the derivatives are zero at ZK. But when I want to consider this, for n, fix n. I want to consider this, okay, fix n, and this is, sorry, fn evaluated at the limit, but since we are dealing with holomorphic functions, we know that the, pardon? the function, the, the, deriva the, the derivatives are in itself, are, are, the, are, also, are also continuous, okay? So this is, in fact, the limit as k tend to plus infinity of n ck so with n fixed. So don't think that this is in the limit. Huh? So this is zero. Right? In other words, Z is in A. Because this turns out to be true for any N. So it is closed. And to complete, you know, A is open. Anything? No, OK. So now take, right, take A in A, I take an open, sub, an open ball centered at A in D. So we take a point in A, and we take a neighborhood of the point in D. If we prove that this neighborhood is, in fact, in A, we are done. So write f of z, and z is in this. to be summation of, as usual, remember that we are assuming that f is holomorphic, so in particular it has a power expansion center at a. Huh? But then remember also that a n is related to the nth derivative of f at a in the following way, right? And we are assuming that A is in A, so this is zero. 
for any n. Correct? So f of z is 0 in b a r for any z. For any z, sorry. For any z, I write it this way. But if it is 0, Locally zero, so what? What's the what's the end of the story? The end of the story: if you you take the expansion of, the, of another point, then the, all the derivatives are zero. So z is in fact in A, and so A is open and closed. In D, this A is D. Now, this implies very important facts. In particular, let me just remind you this version 21. So, corollary. Take F and G holomorphic functions in D such that the set uh, A of point Z in D where the two functions agree has a limit point. So for instance, if A is an open set, this is certainly true. So as a limit point. And what I'm saying, okay, for instance, instance, if A is open, this is this occurs. Okay, so any point is in fact a limit point. So, sorry, any point can be considered. Any interior point is is, is good. Huh? So there are very many. Well, the, then the consequence is that well, f of z coincides with g of z and d. Just as obvious application, and this gives you a very deep inside of the differences of a real analytic function and complex analytic functions, right? Mm -hmm. There is nothing similar to this. Huh? <laughs> you can exhibit functions which agree on an interval, which is an open set or an infinite interval, which are analytic, or can be extended, but they are not, OK? So you, you know this famous a e minus 1 over t squared and the constant 0 and so on. It's not 0 and so on. Right? So this is a very important property of complex. And this explains why it suffices to prove something locally, in a sense, all right? So to start, the, the local study is very important for homomorphism. The definition is, in fact, local. You cannot define something point-wise. You have to, if you want to define something related to complex differentiation, you need an interval, an interval, sorry, a, a ball around the point you are considering. Okay. Um, now, in fact, in, uh, next week, we'll investigate locally the, 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 the features uh, of points, of zero points. Of and it, turn out, and it turns out that I anticip I'm anticipating what we will see, okay, that the zeros are somehow like the zeros of polynomials. So if you have a zero function which is complex analytic, then it has a multiplicity, which is something not, uh, not true eh? for, 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 um, for real complex value, real valid functions. 
you can have well each each uh, each deg each degree of of, of of multiplicity you want. So each uh, each multiplicity is a real number. Okay. So for holomorphic function, this is not true, and we'll define multiplicity of a zero, and then study the singularities and uh, attributes to to singularity and attribute to a singularity something which will be also multiplicity. And then we'll discover that there will be also some extraordinary uh, strange uh, uh, singularities for which there is no possibility to, to, give a, uh, to give a multiplicity, which will be called essential singularities. OK? So I think that today I'll stop here. Questions so far? Uh, I intentionally didn't didn't afford the the the, the calculation which will okay will uh, complete next week. <laughs>